Power Project family. This episode is brought to you by Piedmontese beef. Now we've been eating Piedmontese beef for a very long time now, but the amazing thing about their steaks, and we like to call it diet steaks, is that number one, they have a lot of cuts that are very high fat, but they have a lot of cuts that are low fat. So if you're dieting and you're not eating a lot of fat, you can still enjoy some wonderful tasting steak. Andrew, can you tell them how to get it? Yes, absolutely. You guys got to head over to Piedmontese.com. That's P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E.com at checkout. Enter promo code Power Project for 25% off your entire order. And if your order is $150 or more, you get free two-day shipping. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Head over there right now. All right. Well, we got this guy on the show who punches people in the face <laughs> for a living. Yeah, right? Damn. Dude, who who's the biggest? Uh, not really the biggest, but like, who's just like the most mutated dude in the UFC? Because we've seen a lot of amazing athletes come through there, especially over the last couple of years. Has been like the talent level mm-hmm. of the UFC athletes has been like before. It was like kind of you had like the Tank Abbott, you know, yeah. era, <laughs> yeah. and you had some dudes that just had some heavy hands and knew how to throw bombs. And, and of course there was Hoist Gracie and there's yeah. really talented individuals, but now we're starting to see some really just crazy athleticism in the UFC and your experience, who's been the person that you've been around where you're like, I just don't even know what that's about. Yeah. It's, it's kind of challenging um, because the sport has evolved so much and it's a, uh, there, there's a lot of, instead of just one dimensional fighters now, or, you know, you, when you're talking about athletics and stuff, it's like, there's so many of them. So it's, a, uh, I don't know. I, I would say Yoel Romero though, you mm-hmm. know, he's a, a freakish athlete and uh, he, I want to say he's in his mid forties and he's oh. still, t- t- you, you, would, you wouldn't know, you know? So I'm always wondering like, hopefully, you know, I, I can be like that when I get in my, my early forties. So I would say Yoel Romero for sure. How old are you? I am 36. I'll be 37 uh, in the beginning of the year. Where'd this all start, man? Man, just, uh, I think, you know, I've been an athlete my whole life. Um, I've been a fan of the UFC um, since it was around, you know, like, or when it started back in um, 99, I was watching the UFC events with my best friend before it was mainstream. Um, always saying that I could, you know, I could do this. I, I could, uh, I could beat the guys in there right then. And I was like, what were your friends I, saying about that? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they, they didn't believe me. And uh, <laughs> like, no, bro. And at the time, I would have got killed. That's when it was like Matt Hughes and mm. uh, Tito Ortiz and Liddell and all those guys, Randy Couture. Um, when I went into my first like MMA practice, you know, that was a humbling experience for sure. Um, then I realized right then, like, yeah, these these guys in the UFC would have killed me. Um, but now, fast forward, here I am competing with some of the best in the world, mm. and it's a uh, it's insane. It's been a wild ride. Did you, uh, as a kid, get into fights and stuff like that? Is that kind of what gave you the confidence when you watched it? Like, hey, I can kick these guys' ass or something? <laughs> no, not not really. You know, I, I'm getting like little scuffles here and there, but nothing like too serious. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've never stood on a playground or at school and, and fought someone standing mm-hmm. up for five minutes, you know, you know, just little, <laughs> little, <laughs> little scuffles here and there. But it's just the, I don't know, I think it's just being an athlete and, you know, I played every sport growing up, even though I may not look like I can do a whole lot, you know, I was good at everything, but I I excelled at wrestling. And um, yeah, like I said, I was always just such a fan of mixed martial arts just because it's, uh, I feel like the truest form of and truest sport, like it's two men in there and you're literally trying to hurt the other person. You're trying to finish the person um, in front of the the world. And it's, it's like a barbaric times. It's like gladiator times. It's, it's crazy when you see the fans and everything, how, how passionate they are and how, how just crazy if you think about everything that goes into it and like they're cheering us on like back in the Roman times, like to the mm-hmm. death, like the, it's, right. it's fucking wild. Like, mm-hmm. um, yeah. What always, what I've always <clears throat> kind of been wondering about was when you get into a ring, like as a USC fighter, um, That's when you get to really fight, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But when it comes to sparring, like you actually, I think you won No Gi Worlds as a blue belt in Mm jujitsu, right? But when you spar in jujitsu, you can go out 100%, but you can't spar MMA 100%. So how do you truly get ready for a fight? Because you can't like strike your sparring partner like you would the other guy you're trying to actually fight in the ring, right? No, you're right. And that's, uh, and some people do. Um, For me, I think when you're, 
first getting into the sport, you need your rounds, you know, you know, like with wrestling, you need your mat time, jujitsu, mm -hmm. same thing. Um, you need to box, you need to spar those hard rounds and, and the guys will go 100%. Like okay. say, say boxing sparring, you have 16 ounce gloves on, mm. you have headgear, things like that. Um, when we're doing MMA sparring, it's a little more, we played a little more safer, you know, we'll have bigger gloves on as well. Um, but it's like, we won't put on four ounce gloves and spar because then that's when you can seriously injure your sparring partner or teammate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and you don't want to do that. And, um, you know, I, I got a lot of hard rounds in early in my career and I've wrestled since I was, you know, a, a young child all the way through college and stuff like that. And so, um, I haven't sparred that much in the last few years. Just really? be like, not that hard. I, I do okay. a lot of like, uh, like technical sparring where I'm holding a lot of speed and we're just kind of holding the power. Mm -hmm. um, but I've put in the time, so I know I can fight. I just have to be in the tip top shape. And one of, I feel like one of my, um, one of my friends, he's a professional boxer. Um, I do a lot of boxing rounds with him and it's just a different look, you know, it's like boxers throw punches in bunches. They hit a little different. Like the punches do not stop coming. Whereas MMA, it's like one, two, maybe three strikes. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of reset circle and we're worrying about everything else. But when I put in the time with, uh, Ruben, his name is Ruben Torres. He's out of Sacramento. Um, man, it's just on another level. So then I go in there and I get hit by someone with a four ounce glove. And I'm just like, man, that's, that's it. So it gives me like the confidence. And, um, I felt comfortable just staying in the pocket and, uh, you know, exchanging punches and even, um, yeah, just like blocking and countering, always f firing back. Yeah. So has there ever been anything you've seen from an opponent where like, even before the fight starts, like, cause there's kind of like, I guess the mental game of it. Like, does any of that ever work? Uh, does it, <laughs> like, has any, anybody you ever faced, ever done something in training, uh, working out or like, have you ever seen anything that like intimidated you where you're like, man, I don't know. I don't know what this guy's going to be about when I get in the ring with him. Yeah. I think it's, um, I don't know. It's just my preparation. So I feel like if I'm, I'm prepared and I put in all the work and, um, then I'm confident, you know what I mean? And, and I've been from team alpha male, you know, I've been with some of the best fighters in the world since the beginning. So even before I was in the UFC, before I was even fighting professionally, I was, I was the main training partners for, you know, some of the biggest guys in the sport, you know, and I, I didn't even have a pro fight. So I kind of knew where I, I stood at that moment and I, how I competed with them in practice and just everyone in the world coming around to train with us and I would go with them. So it's like, I know, or I knew where I stacked up. Um, it just took me a little longer to get there. But as far as like intimidation, it, I don't know, it doesn't, I don't really look into like who I'm fighting. I watch a lot of film and I, I, I try to pick up on things that they, um, tendencies that they do that I can capitalize on because they're not going to be able to fix that in a six to eight week training mm -hmm. camp. They've been doing it their entire career and most of their fights. So, so it's a little more like mathematical rather than being like, oh man, my opponent's so strong. I don't know what to do. Yeah. It's like, okay, he has a lot of strengths, but let me see where he's weak and I can pick, maybe I can pick him apart here or there. Yeah. Or if I just see the, 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 you know, the strike that they throw and maybe their hands down me, I can hook off it, maybe land something. Um, when, when they, when they go to that, that exchange. But other than that, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm prepared. I'm, I'm so prepared and, and I can fight and anything can happen. You know, you're fighting the best guys in the world and it's just like, it's inches. And I also say there's a little bit of luck when you get up there, you know, it's like, you have to have a little luck on your side, but for the most part, I'm, I'm ready to go as long as I'm in tip top shape. Um, how did you build, like you mentioned that you did uh, wrestling in high school or you wrestled when you were young. So it means you had a big grappling background and grappling is different than striking. But after you built that background, how did you go ahead and build your ability to throw punches, kicks, et cetera? How did you build those other martial arts into becoming a fighter? How long did it take for you to get proficient at everything else? Yeah, it was it was pretty quick. Like I, I, I've quick. wrestled since I, no, I, that's why I'm saying my athletic ability is like, I can watch someone do something or if they show me something, I can pick up on things really fast. Yeah, And so I loved boxing, you know, and, and I felt like I picked it up fairly quick. Like uh, the footwork is the same. Maybe you're not as wide of a stance, you know what I mean? But like the movement is pretty similar. And then I, you know, I could just, I, I could strike, you know, I, I found my boxing coach, Joey Rodriguez, and uh, we just connected. And it's, uh, 
it's on another level. He can just hold the mitts a certain way. And I, I know every combo and we just have, we just have a, a really strong bond and it's uh, I owe a lot of credit to him, you know, and my, my striking and being able to sit on my punches and, and, and just started to create more and more power later in my career. Mm. Um, but, but I did pick it up pretty quick. And I, I used to like box and when I was, I don't know, middle school, mm -hmm. high school, you know, like when you throw on the gloves and everyone's fighting in the front yards or at like <laughs> these little skate night things, you're boxing after. And I was, I'm a small guy and I was always like a really small guy, kid growing up and saw I'd fight like box these big guys. So yeah. I, I don't know, I just, I, I have that, that fire and that fight in me. So it's, uh, okay. but, but I did pick up boxing fairly quick. Do you feel like a professional athlete? Because, you know, like you, if you're around here in Sacramento and uh, you see a pro athlete, you might see someone from the Kings and they're yeah. like a thousand <laughs> feet tall and stuff like that. Do you feel like a professional athlete? I don't know. It's because you not, are. I mean, you're, you're amongst like this tiny percentage of our population that mm -hmm. was able to figure out how to be a professional fighter. And mm -hmm. then there's no greater. Uh, thing to reach than the UFC. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like you're in the Olympics uh, every time you compete. So it's pretty, it's pretty impressive to me. Yeah, no, it's, I, I feel the same. So I, I don't feel like a pro athlete, you know, it's mm -hmm. uh, like all my friends and family that, that know me, I'm, I'm the same, same <laughs> right. old me, you know, it's right. a, and they forget like when I'm, when I'm going out somewhere and, and people want to take pictures with me, they're like, man, I, I forget like who, who I am or I'm in the UFC. You know what I mean? It, it is, it is weird because I'm never going to change. You know, I'm going to be the same person I always have been. I, I do see some people it gets to their head and, mm. but yeah, I won't ever change. Mm. It, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, cause like I, you know, because I have been around a couple of fighters. Uh, we know our, our boy, uh, Nico uh, Lasagna. Yeah. That's what we call him. Yeah. Nico Lazada. Lazada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't know. I was just like, you, you kind of hear some, some of the uh, people that haven't quite made it yet. There's like, dude, if I just get my shot, like I know I'm going to kick ass in the UFC or whatever. Um, sometimes maybe that shot looks a little bit weird. <laughs> um, I just wanted you to explain, like, basically when you got that phone call, what did it look like when you actually had to fight in your first UFC fight? Yeah, no, it's it's true. There's, I think there's only 500 people um, wow. in the UFC, men, women, all weight classes, mm -hmm. out of everyone in the world. Like how many fighters, MMA fighters are in the world? So there's so many people that would do well and succeed in the sport. Uh, but they, they do need the opportunity. They need their shot. And I was one of those. I was fighting on the regional scene for West Coast Fighting Championship mm -hmm. out of Sacramento. And I was one of the top prospects in the country, like the next to go. Um, I had so many opportunities to, that I was almost in the UFC. I almost got on the Ultimate Fighter twice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I almost got in the UFC when I was 5-0. I was on like this conference call with the matchmakers and stuff, and they went with someone else. So I, I thought I was never going to get in. You know, I almost hung up my gloves and I was, I was done, you know. But then my wife talked to me and she's like, give it one more year. If you don't get in, we'll kind of figure things out. Just because I felt bad that I was, uh, you know, she's chasing this dream with me and it's like, there's no money like early in the sport. Even now, I feel like I'm not getting paid like what we should be getting paid. Um, but yeah, yeah, it is the, the opportunity mm -hmm. you need. It's like, it's a crazy thing. I, I made my debut on a four day notice. Um, <laughs> in, yeah. In the Netherlands. You're fighting um, on Saturday. Like, yeah. okay. In, it's in uh, Rotterdam. <laughs> yeah. In Rotterdam. So it was like Amsterdam. Um, I, I was actually training at the time. I got a, um, a call from Joe Silva, who was the matchmaker back then. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I was in. He's like, hey, Josh, you want to fight Saturday? I said, yeah, for sure. And then I, I talked to him for a while and then I hung up. And I didn't even realize that I was fighting this Saturday. I thought it was like, you know, 10 days, like a week and a half out. And then uh, my coach is like, man, you need to go home and pack. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, we're flying out tomorrow to Amsterdam. <laughs> and so I was like, ah, oh, shit. So I went home. Luckily I had my passport. Otherwise I would Where's not Where's Amsterdam? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Uh, it, it, it was crazy. So I, I literally, I went home, I packed, I, uh, I hopped on a, f a flight and then uh, I got out there. I, I cut my weight and uh, I didn't sleep at all because the time change, um, the time change. And I was so yeah. excited to be there. This is like what I've been working my whole life to, to accomplish. And then I was going up against a tough guy. And uh, I also had one of the worst hand injuries in UFC history that, that, um, that fight, you know, my, uh, I had a compound fracture, my bone sticking out of my finger and I had to hide it from the ref just so I can, keep I can keep fighting. Cause I knew I was going to win. I was dominating the fight. He would have stopped the fight if he saw that. And uh, yeah, 
you know, I didn't care if I lost my damn finger at that moment. I was getting my hand raised. <laughs> yeah. But that was my shot you're talking about. Like mm-hmm. I, I took it. Like th- it's what I worked so hard for. And there was nothing that was, I don't care if they said, hey, you want to fight in an hour? I would I would have been there and I would have made the weight and, and, and got my hand raised. All right. I'm curious, man, because <laughs> how long is the weight cutting process? Because knowing four days out, do you usually give yourself more time to cut weight? Or do you usually do it in like a three to four day thing, get to weight and then do what you got to do? Yeah, normally it's a, it's, it's a long process. And I was... Um, I was fighting at 155, so lightweight. Okay. Um, so, so I want to say I was probably like low 70s um, at that time. So it wasn't that bad. 12, you know, 12 okay. pounds or so. Um, but, but you know, flying and stuff, I felt all swollen and puffy when I got over there, and then no sleep that affects everything as well. And uh, yeah, so it, it worked out well. It's, it was hard, but fighting at featherweight 145 is on a, a, another level. That that's my not the one I just fought um, mm-hmm. Saturday, but the the fight in 2020 where I, I tore my ACL in the first 19 oh, okay. seconds of the first round. So that's why <laughs> it's uh, you tore your. So right now you're fighting with a torn ACL. Yeah, yeah, I've been for uh, 90 seconds already. It was the, one of the first exchanges. <laughs> so you'll see my my it's my lead leg, my left leg. It keeps buckling. It's right there. Oh, oh fuck. yeah. So you'll see uh, it. Yeah, it was. How'd it you was, do in this fight, by the way? I won. I you, got yeah, fight of the fight of the night. We were mm-hmm. fight of the year candidate, um, but it just wasn't the performance I wanted, um, just because I had no stability what, in my uh, knee. Yeah, what I mean, I'm. It's you know, <laughs> it's one of the things you got to stand on, right? But like, <laughs> what what did it take away from your game? Like, did you have something else in mind to try to do that you had, and then you're like, okay, well that's fucking gone. Yeah, my my movement, uh, I couldn't move as well. I couldn't go to the body. Do a, I couldn't wrestle just because. Um, yeah, it was so damn painful. And and not only did I tear my ACL in that exchange, I tore my ACL completely. I tore my MCL. I had my Baker's cyst, you know, everyone has behind their knee. I ruptured that. When the ACL snapped, my femur and tibia hit so hard that I fractured my femur and tibia. But it's it's just that, uh, it's that, that will to win. And, that, uh, you know, we were talking about this earlier. I'm yeah, like, yeah. It's either... I have a crazy mindset with like, I welcome the pain. I know it's going to hurt. It's like a, it's like flooring your car into a, a tree with no seat belt. You hope things turn out for the best, Jeez. but you have no idea. And so how many rounds did this go? Three rounds. So it was 15. I fought 14 and a half minutes with no, with that injury. It was just kind of a lackluster <laughs> performance to me. I don't, I don't know. He's <laughs> he, kicking you in the he leg. Knew yeah, that no, shit. he knew. And he's a big ass guy. Like yeah. I thought he was at uh when I first met him a long years ago, I thought he was a welterweight, but he's huge. Yeah. He fights at 145. He definitely wasn't 45 there. No. Huge. Oh God, yeah. Th- well, th- that conversation sparked because, uh, you know, he's telling me about his, his knee and I'm just like, what the fuck is it? <laughs> like you guys are just a different pedigree, like uh, uh, fighters, like, Dude, if I twist my ankle getting out of my seat, I'm just like, guys, sorry, we got to cancel the podcast. <laughs> like, uh, maybe we'll try again in about a month or two <laughs> when I heal up, you know. But I mean, you're, f- dude, like, d- it's remarkable. Did that start at a at a different time before you ever got into the cage? Yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, I work with a mind coach. His name is Joshua Manuel, and he's uh, he works with a lot of special forces and and law enforcement officers. And is he local? No, he's out of Van- Vancouver. So he's, uh, man, it, it's different. I've worked with like sports psychologists and stuff, but we've been working for five years and um, it's almost like a hypnosis. Like I do a lot of visualization, you know, the mind's so powerful and uh, he puts me into like these deep trances and even in the the fights, you know, I, I visualize, like he puts me in like the locker room. He puts me mm. uh, watching the fight uh, from my coach's uh, viewpoint from a bird's eye viewpoint, we fast forward to the after party celebrating with my friends and family. And we just go over all these uh, just different scenarios. And I'm always getting my hand raised. I'm, I, it, it's hard to explain. Like, no, I get it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's anytime you've lost, mm-hmm. uh, you have shown up on the scene and like you went to go do your thing and it's completely different mm-hmm. than what you thought it was going to be. Yeah. And so you're already playing it out. Like this is the way it's going to look ish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There might be some like different stuff. Like somebody might forget the tape for my gloves, but none of that really matters. Like yeah. we'll fucking figure it out or whatever. Yeah. 
They just play out every little detail of, of warm up, preparation, everything, all yes. that stuff. And it's even, we've done some stuff and he has, he records them too. So it's like the exact same finishes. And I've, I've hit them in two fights, like dead on. I visualize the Michael Johnson fight, like mm -hmm. me hitting him with the overhand right and him just like falling straight over me, walking away. Um, yeah, this right here. <laughs> Oh, you know, and that's the first time he's ever been knocked out. And, uh, that was nice. And, and like the Mursad, beautiful shot. Mursad Bektik fight, I, I didn't know like how I was going to get it done, but I knew I was wow. going to walk away and he was on all fours while the ref was kind of like breaking us up and oh, we've done that as well. So it's a, uh, uh, yeah, he, he, he's helped me a ton. I have so many people in my, like, you know, I say my team, not just team alpha male, but my team, like team Emmett that man, I, I owe everything to them. Like from my, my dietitians, my mind coach, my chiropractors, you know, it's like literally everybody that just helps me get to where I, I need to be. And it's like, I, I couldn't be more grateful for them. When something like that happens to like your hand or with your knee, there's got to be at least a, a second of like you taking some diagnostic of like what, <laughs> like, okay, what is, what is that? Yeah. And then what's the next, what's the next thing you go to? I mean, I would, I would guess like, what would happen for me if I was in your shoes, I would be like, dude, you bet you box with a professional boxer all the time. Yeah. So it sounds like we're just going to stand up and let's see what happens with that. Yeah. And it, it, and it is true. Cause I'm going through all these, like, I'm like talking to myself, you know, cause some of the stuff is so damn painful. And, and when you, when your finger hurts, like when I did that and I look down and the bone sticking out and it's like, just want to barf. It, it's like, yeah, it's, it's like all the way off. So every time I would block a kick, um, I would see sweat going out of like, you know, my peripherals and I had to keep looking cause I thought my finger was getting kicked off. So I kept looking to make sure it's still there cause the glove would stop it when it would <coughs> flap back. Fuck. Um, but then my knee that was on another level. And I'm like, there's a reason why you don't see football players finishing the set of downs or finishing the quarter when they tear their ACL yeah. or something else, they get carted on. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm having these conversations with myself, like just knowing me, I, I could have quit right then. And then, you know, the injuries come out, everybody would have been, <laughs> yeah, there's the thing. Thanks Andrew. <laughs> You're welcome. Everybody would have been okay with it. Like I would not have been okay with it because if I gave up and, and I had to live with that, like knowing that I gave up, like, I was already in like a dark, dark time, just all the, the issues I had with the knee and I didn't heal and I had to go back and do multiple procedures. Um, this was after the fight or this was before that fight where you tore your knee? Uh, yeah, after the ACL after fight. The ACL. Yeah, so I had a lot of issues uh, with the, the surgery. And so if I would have just given up, then I would have had to deal with that as well. And I would have got half a check. So even some of the stuff I, I think about, it comes down to like finances. Um, you know, in my mind, I'm saying, okay, I look at the clock, there's 14 and a half minutes left. I'm like, 14 and a half minutes, like fight your ass off. You'll be happy. You'll get your, your show and your win bonus. And then, you know, that turned into being, you know, fight of the night. Um, so we got another check and, uh, you know, so I, so I was happy with it, but it, I was happy after the fact during, I was, I was so pissed, uh, just cause I knew I hurt my knee. I was going to be out for a while. Um, and it was a, a major injury, you know, and I'm, I'm getting older. I'm not, I'm not young like I used to be. So it takes even longer for me to, to recover and heal. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where my, my mindset goes. It's easy to get a little bit of that. Why me yeah. type of thing going on, but then you can also kind of you know, you're a fucking professional fighter. You're in a mm -hmm. great spot. There are people that would say, I would die to be in your position. Yep. Like I would lose a finger to be in your position. So I guess that's the thing you got to be mindful of is that when, especially when you were younger, mm -hmm. you would be that person saying that, right? Oh, yeah. I would have done anything to be there. And uh, I'd be like, I can't believe that guy gave up because his fingers hurts. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <It's weak. laughs> yeah. And it's, <laughs> yeah. So no, I, I agree with that. And uh, yeah, it's, and every time I come back, you know, I, everything works out and happens to me for a reason. I used to be that way, like, man, why the hell is this happening to me? But then I, I, I had to stop thinking about that because if I, you know, something horrible happens, it always leads me to a, a bigger and better path. Mm -hmm. And I think if that didn't happen, I would have went this way and it wouldn't have turned out the way things are going. So I, I truly believe everything happens for a reason. And for some reason, I'm always like, taken care of by some something, you know, and, and blessed in, in a sense. And even with this knee injury, um, took me 18 months, months to come back. 
Um, and was that the fight before this one? Yeah. Yeah. So this was my first fight back in 18 months. Mm, okay. Um, yeah. So it was tough. So I, I had an ACL reconstruction. I did the patellar tendon for whatever reason, my, my patella tendon and patella did not heal. Correct. When they took the graft. So I, um, I was doing PT and I was so far ahead of everybody. Like I, I wanted to be the Adrian Peterson at MMA. Mm. I wanted to come back. I wanted to fight four to six months and that had never been done. And I was ahead of a schedule and I was on track to do that, but I kept having anterior knee pain. Um, and so the PT was like, I said, is this affecting my ACL in any way? And she's like, no. Um, so I just kept going through with everything. I talked to the doctor at the four month marker and kept complaining about that pain. And they're like, let's just get an MRI just in case. So we did that. And um, he's like, no wonder you're in so much pain because the patella, I had a huge fracture in my kneecap, never healed. And then the patella tendon, you know, right under the, the, the kneecap where they took the graft, it never healed and closed. So it was this huge vertical mm -hmm. tear still. And so, you know, I was like, that that's why that, that happened. I have a, a friend and doctor out of Sacramento, Dr. Panero, that he helped me when I had all these facial fractures and bad vertigo from one of my fights. So um, he took the lead on that and got me the help I needed. He also took the lead on this and um, he specializes in stem cells. So we, we went back in and um, he drilled into my back, my SI joints, they extracted the bone marrow and injected, you know, the stem cells straight through my kneecap and patella tendon. That was another painful thing. So this is last Christmas. So this is six months post-op and here I am again, going, you know, back in for a different procedure. Um, I had to be back in a brace, no weight bearing, uh, my quad atrophied again. Um, I was, I had to start over basically, but that kind of stimulated the growth factors and, and started the, the healing process. Mm -hmm. And so again, I, I can't thank him enough because without him, who knows where I would be, you know? So I, I started over again a year ago and then been working my ass off. And then I got back with my old uh, physical therapist, Russ Dunning from Kime uh, in March. And then we put in hundreds and hundreds of hours. He was seeing me uh, five to six days a week, mm. two days, a, two times a day, just so I could get back to feeling somewhat normal. Mm. Did you talk with your mind coach about the knee stuff and uh, how did that work out? Yeah, I did. And, and he gave me a lot of uh, little tools and, and things to, you know, kind of do and visualize. And, uh, you know, it's almost like uh, thinking of like, little guys or something in my knee and they're in there and they're fixing my knee and doing all this, these things. So I, I had to go through and, and do that as well. And just, I, I did a lot of other things just in that, but that's one of the things that just stands out that I can think of. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Because there's this guy, mm -hmm. you keep bringing, you, you, your mind went there too. Yeah. Um, there's this dude, Joe Dispenza. He had this like bad back accident. And literally what he said is that he would visualize like healing and little things going on with oh, wow. each vertebrae. He would visualize that. And after a few months, he actually was, everything got healed, even though he wasn't supposed to be able to walk again. Right. Oh, wow. So what did your mind coach like have you do and how often would you do that specifically for your knee? How, what did that look like? Yeah, I was doing it. Like I'm, I'm obsessed with certain things that I want. Mm -hmm. And so all the time, like probably not too much, but I, I was just like all the time I was visualizing this and even he'd run me through you know, deep trances and stuff like that. And uh, kind of the same thing, how I was talking about the fights, you know, like seeing it from all angles, uh, me competing at a high level again with like my knee better than it was. And just like, just kind of whatever you could think of. So I would think of these, yeah, just little characters or I don't even know really what they look like in my mind, but they're in there and they're little sewing. robots or something. Yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking little robots, minions, whatever they are. And they're sewing up my patella tendon and they're like, packing the patella with, you know, mm -hmm. bone and it's healing. So I just, whatever. They got some Bondo and shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wh whatever works, you know, just gluing it and piecing, piecing me back together. So I would do that all day, every day. And then uh, when I would talk to him, his, uh, his Instagram and his, his website's his fight, fight mindset. Yeah, um, check it out. Yeah, sure. Joshua Manuel, he, he's amazing. How is I, it now? Yeah. Actually, by the way, like the, the knee, like compared to what it was like before the surgery, et cetera, like yeah. how is it now? The, the ACL is strong. Like we were just talking about this before the show too. It's mm -hmm. um, everyone's asking before the fight, the lead up, you know, how's, uh, 
how's the knee? I'm like, oh, it's better than my other knee, but no, it wasn't. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's just not as springy. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I, it's it's definitely getting better, but I feel like people say that it takes about 18 months to two years till you're, you know, back to 100. percent I feel like I'm like a year out just because I had to start over again last year. So mm-hmm. maybe in another year it'll be, you know, 100. percent But somebody says something <laughs> like, "How you doing, Josh?" You know, you're like. It's probably going to take me about an hour and a half to go over the list of things <laughs> that are wrong with me right now. But let me yeah. just tell you that I'm doing great. It's easier. Yeah. It's like easier it. for your mindset, right? Yeah. Because you can probably be like at any time, you can be like, yeah, you know what? My elbow's a little weird and this yeah. knee is off and this shoulder hurts. I got punched in the face last week, so my <laughs> eye kind of hurts. Yep. I'm sure there's like a long list of yeah. shit you oh. can point out that you're... I feel like scripted too. You know, when people <laughs> ask me something, I just, I repeat the same thing. So I feel... I feel bad for my wife or like close friends that are with me all the time because they've heard the, the story a million times. You know, I'm like, sorry guys. <laughs> I got a new one for you when somebody asks you how you're doing. What's that? Say that you're horny. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it. Then maybe they'll leave me alone. That'll turn in the other direction. You're like, I'm really horny. Today. I like that. I like <laughs> they it. might be like, what? <laughs> Widen your eyes a little bit. I'm horny. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> exactly. That's a good oh, one. God damn. So how's the knee now? Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's doing good. You know, it's a little sore. I'm actually going to go get a, um, MRI just to play it safe. You know, I, I saw the PT out in Vegas, Heather Linden, and she, uh, I, they think I just kind of sprained my LCL and have like a, a small hamstring tear behind mm-hmm. the knee, but that's, I'll take that all day. That's nothing, um, compared to, you know, what I went through. So I'll, I'll be good and hopefully back in practice in I don't know, a week and a half or so. How do you get the belt? What do we got to do? Uh, Who do we got to talk to about this belt? So hopefully, like what I'm campaigning for, I, my hope, my next fight, I, I want it to be a title eliminator. You know, I'm the only fighter that has not fight like or fought the the top guys, the, the champions, the top three guys. They've all fought each other mm. uh, multiple times. Mm-hmm. And who uh, are these guys? So it's Alexander Volkanovski is the champion. Mm. You know, Max Holloway. Um, he, he was the champion for so long. Volkanovski beat him twice. They're going to fight again, March 5th. Um, and then there's, you know, Korean zombie. Um, there's, there's really, I haven't got to fight any of those guys. I think I match up stylistically the best with the champion. You know, he, he's the, he's the best in the world in our, our weight class, but you know, I think I match up so well. And, uh, yeah. So my next fight, I want it to be a title eliminator. The winner of that gets a shot at Max and, uh, Volkanovski. How long does it look like? So you just had this fight. That fight happens in March. So projection wise, like how long does it look like until if, if you were able to get a match after that one, mm-hmm. when would you think it would be? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I, 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 I'm hoping to fight maybe March or April. We'll see, get back in there and do the title eliminator. And then it depends on what goes on with, uh, you know, the, the champion, they can, have a little longer layoff, but sometime in 2020, whether it would be international fight week, July, Mm -hmm. uh, sometime around, you know, 4th of July or, you know, towards the end of the year. And what does title eliminator mean? Uh, Whoever wins that gets the shot at the Mm, title. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of like the, the semifinals. Okay. (laughs) Have, uh, I don't know, have you, has it ever crossed your mind to do like some of the, uh, like the post fight antics or even out of the cage type thing, like, you know, like some McGregor yeah. shit where you're talking shit cause you're very well spoken. So I, I've, in my opinion, this is below you, but I don't know. Has anybody ever said like, uh, maybe you should start talking shit so you yeah. can get that. Make a scene, make yeah. more money. I, yeah. I, I've heard that so much, but mm-hmm. I'm just like, man, that's, that's not me, you know? And like you said, try to be a Conor McGregor. There's only one Conor McGregor and everyone's trying to be like him. And I think they <laughs> look stupid, worse, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, cause it's clear, like he, he, he made so much money and, and mm-hmm. you know, it's good for him. And he, he brought more eyes to the sport and stuff like that. But a lot of people try to try to be like him and you know, I didn't go to acting school. I didn't do any of that. Like I can fight, man. So it's like anytime I'm on a card, like the fans are excited to see me fight. You know, they're not excited to see me like, you know, shit talk people. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know these opponents. So it's like, yeah, I'm just, I'm not going to talk about people I don't know or what's going on in their life and stuff. So you're in a fight and you tear your knee and you're in a fight and your fingers all jacked up and broken. Um, What happens when somebody just hits you harder than you've ever been hit before? Like what, what kind of, 
what goes through your mind, especially like a body shot or something? You're just like, whoa, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I better figure out something slightly different to do with this person. Or has that even happened? Yeah, it, has, it hasn't happened, you know, I, and, and I feel like um, in sparring though, like going back to sparring some of the boxers and Ruben, it's like, it's on a, it's on a different level. And it's like him and I would go and we used to spar hard on Friday nights. So it was like a damn, it was a fight. We do eight to 10, three minute rounds. And where now you're talking about someone hitting hard, like whose body bruises? Like when he's going to the body, I'll have bruises here and we're like, we're hurting each other. But I, I was doing that early on. It's like, I don't need to take that much damage because we're not getting paid for that, you know? Um, but that was insane. We were just bloodied up and that was like a fight. So I, so I haven't been like in a, in a real fight, you know, hit, too hard. There was one on the regional scene uh, at West Coast Fighting. He was an ex UFC guy. I fought him, and the only the hardest hit I ever got hit by was Christos Yagos. Uh, he hit me right in the neck, mm. and so that that was different. So I just felt like my whole left side just went numb, and I felt <laughs> these crazy like tingle sensation to my head as I'm in the fight. Um, if that would have landed on the chin, who who knows? It might have been a different story, but. Um, so now that I think about it, there's only one and that's, that's the shot, but I ended up knocking him <laughs> out. And, you know, that was the first time he had ever been knocked out. And that was a hell of a fight because I got paid $1,000 for that fight. We would have got fight of the night for sure. I would have gotten knocked out of the night for sure. And it was the craziest fight mm -hmm. on like a local scene. So it's like, I made a thousand bucks where mm -hmm. I could have made a few hundred if it was in the UFC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you talked to us a little bit before the show about your weight cut. I, I found it interesting because one, I'm actually curious, what made you go from, because you said I think your first UFC fight was 155, now you're at 145. What made you make that decision? And then secondly, it's interesting how like you, you, you'll cut down to 145 and the next day y'all are like 170 and 180. Yeah. Do you think that that should be, <clears throat> like, do you, do you find that's advantageous for you since you come from a wrestling background and you're, you know how to cut? Or do you think that there should be something that's that's regulated there because it just seems weird at least from yeah. someone looking in you know yeah um yeah so i was fighting on the regional scene at 155 mm -hmm. um i got into the ufc and i and i i won my first two fights so my plan was always to go featherweight 145 once i got in the ufc mm -hmm. um since i was undefeated i was doing well i wasn't going to change anything but I, I actually, in my third lightweight fight um, in the UFC, I fought a guy, Desmond Green, in Buffalo, in his hometown. And uh, I feel like I got hometown. I feel like I won that fight to this day mm. still, but he won on the scorecards by split decision. And so, you know, I'm, even that, I'm grateful for that loss because it made me reevaluate things. And I'm like, this is the time to, to make the cut to one fe 145 featherweight. And so I, I, I did just that. Uh, if I would have won that fight, I would have stayed at 55s, you know? So yeah. who knows if I would be where I am right now. And um, yeah, I've, uh, you know, I, I work with the best dietitians in the country, perfecting athletes. It's Dr. Michelle, Paulina and Denise, and they're on another level. They were the dietitians for the US boxing uh, team. And they, they, they work with some of the best boxers too, like Teofimo Lopez, uh, Terrence Crawford, uh, Shakur Stevens, like all these guys, they work with top UFC mm. um, champions as well. And so I've been working with them for a, a few years now. And man, it's amazing. Like we were talking about the cut. I thought I was doing a really good job and knew what I was doing until I started working with them. Like it, it's literally, I, I'm working <laughs> so much smarter instead mm -hmm. of harder. Like just the way they have me eat, the supplements they have me take, like it's all about recovery and sleep and things like that, which I, which I know um, and everything about decreasing my cortisol levels. And then the way I cut the water is, man, it's, it's just something different. And I, I can't tell people my secrets, but I, uh, ask. I, 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 I'll tell you guys after, but I, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, good. I, um, I used to use plastics and, and sauna suits, mm -hmm. or, I mean, sauna suits and, and saunas and, and, just work my ass off all fight week and stuff, just trying to dehydrate. But now it's like my last two fights, no sauna, no plastics. Um, I'm not really even doing anything fight week and my I'm eating and drinking a ton. And it's really the last like, I don't know, maybe 10 hours. I'm, you know, I, I feel horrible, but 
I was feeling horrible for weeks leading up to a fight before. So you have enough time to feel good to where when you get back in the ring, you feel amazing. Yeah, and you're replenished yeah. and you're you're good to go, right? A hundred percent. They all their hydration protocol, the food they have me eat. Um, I feel so good. It's like, a science, though. It's not like you weigh in and you eat a bunch of donuts. No, no, yeah. I eat like what I've been eating for eight to ten weeks, and then I eat. They, it's like a concierge service too. They come out fight week, mm. and you know they'll they'll work on me like physical therapy. Yeah. Um, they cook all my meals. I'm drinking all these green juice. I'm I'm doing tons of juices and and just everything. It's like, man, I I feel so good, and I cannot thank them enough. Like. Mm. <laughs> Once again, you went from 185 to 145. Yeah, this is 40 pounds. Yeah, typically I I walk around around like yeah 185. When I'm eating good and like loving life, if, if I like get on a, a stricter <laughs> diet, I'll, I'll, I'll be high 70s. You know, 78, okay. 79. Okay. And then yeah, I have some pictures of my like 185 to 145 cut. It's uh, what's uh a, any idea on what this deal is with Conor McGregor? Like where they I don't know if you've seen like uh, uh all over the internet he gained 32 pounds and they're like oh, he gained yeah, 32 he pounds of muscle jacked. and he looks yeah he looks swole. But I think a lot of you guys will look really swole when you're not like I mean when you're fighting you'll look shredded yeah and then a handful of days later a lot of times you'll blow up and look big right yeah it's like a physique competition people say I could do like a physique competition when I'm at 145 because you mm -hmm. can see every damn muscle in my my body and then uh, mm -hmm. then it's more like a bodybuilder as we get bigger um turned into a power lifter maybe <laughs> towards the end yeah, there we go. <laughs> there. but it's like but you guys know you can't put on 32 pounds yeah, of muscle right, but right. he's he's bigger and right um mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't really seen too much of that. I, I see that he's huge, though. Like, I want, <laughs> yeah. what's he weigh right now? I don't know. He looks like he's like 190 or something. He pulled up yeah. a couple of pictures, Andrew. Yeah, I'll look for him. I was, I was trying is, to find the it, picture. It almost looks fake. Like, I, I saw his face and he was so damn big. I was like, <laughs> could be. It's the fucking internet. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this is the thing. Like, you are doing cardio based training multiple times a week. I don't mm -hmm. know. How, how much do you lift right now in terms of lifting? Um, I, I do three days a week. Um, three days a week. But it's more like sports specific training and stuff right. like that. We're working on like, you know, speed, power, like mm -hmm. things like that. Whereas, yeah. And yeah. if you just slow down the, like this is the thing, if you slow down the cardio a little bit and you just chose to, like, I'm just going to fucking lift weights and eat food, you'd be 210. Or if I was in here with you guys, damn. <laughs> you, you'd fucking get to yeah. 210 and like, honest, like maybe 205. I'd say you could do that shit in two months. Yeah, I, I could do it. And that's one thing. Like <laughs> I don't have mm -hmm. an issue with putting on weight. I, I used to be, uh, you know, I, I used to be, like watch all like the bodybuilding oh, yeah, bodybuilding stuff and like I was on like Jay Cutler's diet and stuff and I was nice. waking up eating all the rice and all the stuff back in the day when I, and I wanted to get up to 200 I was like I was like 198 and yeah. I was huge like I remember when I would go mm -hmm. do bench I'd warm up with like two plates hit it 15 times oh, and shit, I was up shit. to like I, I was big I was wearing like XL shirts and they'd fit me <laughs> like mediums do right now but it's uh but then I I I had no flexibility and I had shin <laughs> splints and like, mm. it was, it was horrible. My, my wife's like, oh, it's like you have a hot dog in the back of your head. You just got like a roll in my, I don't know. Bruh, I was how, big. How long has your wife been with you through all, <laughs> yeah. like has she been with you yeah, since everything. the beginning of the fight? Like Everything, yeah, we've been together so long. Um, yeah, 16, 17 years, you know, we've been married for 10. Whoa. Yeah, we've been, yeah, high school sweethearts. It's, uh, she's been with me since the beginning, like, you know, college wrestling, uh, my amateur debut or amateur fight, everything. So it's like, yeah. yeah. Where'd you go to college? Uh, I went to Sac City College and then I went to Menlo College in the Bay Area in like the Silicon Valley. It's a private college near Stanford in AI. So, dude, Andrew, I think my testosterone's low. Really? And I also think my cortisol is messed cortisol. up. Cortisol. What the? F and I had a buddy at a gym tell me that my thyroid might be. Oh, my thyroid. Yeah. Well, you know what, guys? If you've been saying this to yourself from time to time, which I know I have in the past, that's why we've partnered with Merrick Health, owned by Derek from More Plates, More Dates. And Merrick is the premium telehealth HRT and CRT clinic that we get our blood work done with. Now, the great thing about Merrick is that you'll get your blood work done. You'll work with the patient care coordinator and they will give you a specific plan tailored to you and your numbers. That is very important because a lot of other clinics give you cookie cutter plans for the every single person. And it doesn't work because not everybody's the same. So Andrew, how can people get it? Yeah, absolutely. Stop guessing and stop trying to throw you know, darts out of the wall, trying to figure out what's wrong with you. Just get your blood work done so you know exactly what's going on. Uh, head over to MerrickHealth.com. That's M-A-R-E-K Health.com. And at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT10 to save 10% off your entire order of labs. Again, MerrickHealth.com. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Uh, let's get back to this podcast. 
It sounds like your wife has a lot of uh, like belief and confidence in you. Uh, where did your own belief and confidence in yourself come from? Did it come from like grandpa or your dad or your mom or family yeah, little, interaction? Or yeah, something? a little bit of everything. I think it's just my my upbringing. I had a tough tough upbringing, childhood, um, and even yeah, just my mom. Just seeing everything she's gone through and and stuff like that. And yeah, I could say my grandpa as well. And um, that's why this last fight was so important to me, just because. I had so many things go on in 2020. It was, it was hard for everyone, but then it's like, I lost my older brother. I lost my grandpa, you know, before I, I lost my father, like 13 years before. And it was just seeing like all the pain my, my mom went through and my, my family, like the Lowry's, the Emmett's, the Walters. Um, that's what motivated me too. Even though I was going through this knee injury, it's like, that's nothing compared to like, it means it doesn't mean a whole lot to like me. It's hard to, describe that just the, the pain I saw my family going through and just yeah it was that's what motivated me and that's what got me up and you know I wanted to make them proud and I wanted to dedicate this to my brother and my dad and my grandpa and my my family I understand it's like more it's more like uh when someone dies it's like more like long-term pain you know De dealing with pain for like yeah. I don't know I'm in this ring for 15 minutes yeah. like I'll just figure out I'm, I'm a fighter I'll deal with it right yeah and that's the thing it's like yeah, it's uh, I'm in a controlled environment for 15 minutes. That's you chose it. You yeah, chose and to do that's it. me. It's like yeah. that, that's nothing. It can potentially go 15 minutes, and I have someone there to protect me if it doesn't go my way. It's like there's I'm fighting for so much more, and even just today, I had my um, one of my really good friends, his uh, his cousin that I've known forever. He he just passed away last night. You know, it's like. In, in a car accident, I'm like, my wife and I are talking, I'm like, shit, life is too short. Like it really is. And like, we take that for granted. And it's just like, that's what I'm saying. Like reach out to people you've been thinking about. Like life is fucked up, man. It, it really is, you know? What about kids? Yeah, we, we don't have any kids. We have a French bulldog. We're like, the, uh, <laughs> we're like the only ones out of all of our friends that don't have kids. I mm -hmm. have, you know, I have my nephews. I have godchildren. We have, um, that was always the plan five years ago, mm -hmm. but now we're getting older and it's like, it's still the plan, but we're, we're in a weird position. Like something would serious have to give like my career or my wife's right now. And so we're going to revisit that in like, like another year and a half or mm -hmm. so. Um, and we, we love our life right now. We've, we've always dreamed of doing these things and we just started to be able to do things mm -hmm. we've always wanted to over the last two years. Mm. So I know how hard <laughs> it is. I, I see it firsthand. And even though it's your kid and it's different and you know, you create all these memories, when we we love to travel, when we go travel, it would not be the same. You yeah. know what I mean? I don't care what people say. <laughs> like <laughs> I'd see it. <laughs> no, it's very yeah. smart. There's no turning back. Once yeah. you have a kid, you have a kid and that's it. And that yeah, of course that'd be our, our world and it would be great, but we're uh, we're just not ready yet, that's for sure. Man, I, I want like Right now, with you, where you are, you're 36, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you feel, I know that you had your surgeries or whatever, but physically, as far as like, um, you know, how fast you move, et cetera, Yoel Romero, you mentioned he's like 45. Do you feel like you have a lot left that mm -hmm. like you're not, you're not slowing down? Because a lot of guys are like, oh, when you get into your 30s, blah, 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 things slow down. Mm -hmm. How do you feel right now? Yeah, I actually, I talk about this a lot. I, I feel the best I've ever felt. You know, even though I got into the sport later, I had my, my first amateur fight when I was, I want to say like 26 or 27. I've had a lot of injuries too. Like um, even my first pro fight, you know, I, I broke my hand in the, in the first round. So I'm always having these like year layoffs, you know? So I have plenty of time to recover when I go in and I fight someone for 15 minutes and then I take a year off to recover and let everything uh, kind of heal. Um, yeah, I, I feel amazing. And now I have everything dialed in with my team. Like, and I continue to get better. I, I still feel like I'm fast. And, you know, I know people talk about with age, you lose speed first. Is that right? But you, you still, you know, keep, keep the power. I still feel like I'm getting more powerful because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing the things I need to do and lifting. I'm sitting on my punches. I'm working on like a lot of technique and, and I still feel fast. But um, I think I seriously have like a good two years to make a run at the title. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel like my career goes so much beyond that. Um, like I could see myself fighting till, you know, in my forties. And, and I used to not think that I'm like, oh, I want to be done, 
you know, before I'm 40 and like, I'm thinking like 38 or so, I'll be 37 in March mm -hmm. and, and I feel the best I've ever felt. So now it's like, we're just gonna keep adding on to that and, and literally, yeah, just right till the wheels fall off. You know, that's my mindset. Well, it's a little different than boxing, you know, boxing, maybe you'd have more concern about like head injury. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there's could be head injury in what you're doing, but it seems like most people are fairly skilled to the point where if you are going to get hit, uh, it's like a, it's a good punch that lands and you're out and you're not mm -hmm. taking like, I think accumulation is what probably causes more of that brain damage than anything else. I would probably, say right? so. Cause in, in boxing, it's like, it's really about who can get hit harder and just keep moving forward. You know, like, like those guys get dropped, they get concussed you have 10 seconds to get back up and then keep doing it. So how many times do people get concussed in boxing? Whereas MMA, like we're not designed to take these type of blows to the head, but it's it's like if there's a flash knockout or you know you knock someone down and hop on them, the, the ref will stop it. So you're not gonna get concussed multiple times. You could, but right. it's not like boxing, you know? So yeah, I 100% I agree with that. I wanna quickly, I don't mean to take us back, but no. I want to go back to what you were talking about with your mindset coach. And I wanna understand you as an athlete, cause I don't know how often you're getting on a call with him and he's leading you through these different visualizations, but what has this individual taught you um, in terms of practices of visualization that you now do on your own and how often do you do that? Because there's probably a lot of athletes listening and we know how beneficial visualization and all of that can mm -hmm. be for whatever it is you're doing as an athlete. So how do you do it on your own? Yeah, so I've, I've always, done a lot of visualization, like before I started working with him, but over the last five years, it's kind of going back to my dietitians. It's like, I thought I was doing it right. And, and I was, it's better than nothing, but he's, he's just everything, not even just in athletics, like this can be in like business relationships, whatever it is. Like all I do is visualize different things. And I'm like always playing like scenarios out in my head and just like for the, for the better, you know, and just super optimistic. And just with some of the tools that he's taught me for fighting, I, you know, I, I use that, um, you know, for other, um, yeah, just parts of my life and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it's, it's kind of crazy. My, my mom, we used to do these vision boards. You guys know anything yeah. about that? So yeah. <laughs> my mom, she's a naturopath. And so it's like, I never went to a doctor oh, as a kid. So it's like, unless I needed an X-ray, if I thought someone was broken or a physical, of course, to play uh -huh. sports. So she'd make all these like Chinese concoctions when I was sick and I, <laughs> I never went to the doctor. So I grew up, you know, eating really well and she cooked everything. We didn't have processed stuff. Mm. And um, so I'm thankful now, but at the time I would go to my friend's house and they would have everything. And I would like raid their- <laughs> My mom was the same, bro. Right? And, <laughs> and cabinets. And then I was always like, mom, why can't we, we couldn't even have soda in the house. Same. Like, yeah, nothing. So it's like, we would do even like vision boards and like around, you know, New Year's. And it, it's kind of crazy that I would, uh, I would put these things on this board and then, I found one, um, I don't know, it was up in the attic, like before I got in the UFC and I had like UFC, I wasn't even training. I was a fan of the sport. I had all these things like, and it was like real, you know, like even just going back to, I don't know where that came from, but even just going back to some of that stuff, like I've always done visualization and, and, and put out things that I want, you mm -hmm. know? And so just going back to the mind coach, he's, he's given me so many tools that I try to apply to everything. And it, it's so beneficial and, yeah, it's, it's just like, yeah. and being optimistic, you know, but you, you have to go and do something about it too. You can't just think good things. And if you're not working, like that does nothing for you. <laughs> I think a lot of times when people are lost, they're not, uh, they don't have like a lack of time. They just have a lack of direction mm -hmm. and a vision board or something similar or writing something down mm -hmm. uh, can give you like a target. And yeah. then now you got a target and then it's like, okay, well, what are some actionable things I can do that would line me up with that target? Yep. And there's less reasons to get anxious about it and be upset about it when, if you're not fulfilling some of those things, you, you're trying to lose weight, uh, you're not eating better, you're not walking, you're not sleeping, mm -hmm. you're constantly stressed out. Well, it's uh, no wonder that the scale's not going down. Like it, and again, <laughs> yeah. it's not anything to get all upset about, but it's like, how do I take those items and, and put them back into action and make sure they're happening and how do I have coping mechanisms with each and every day mm -hmm. uh, so I don't get thrown off into like bad habits? Yeah. What are some things that your coach maybe uh, shared with you about uh, going through some family uh, deaths, family tragedies? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm very goal oriented too. So I wrote right, all my goals down and then try to 
uh, you know, work towards them every day as well. And it's like, um, yeah, well with that, I don't know. I, it was kind of hard cause I, with like the family, I, I just talked about it like last week during fight week, it was the first time I had talked about something and it was just so hard. Cause when I would think about this or talk about it, it was just super emotional. And I, I don't know, it was just hard for me. Um, and that's one thing with me. It's like, I, I always keep everything bundled up inside and then it's just, it's, that's not good either, <laughs> you know, but then, but it's like my close friends I'll talk to and mm-hmm. my, and, and my wife and it's like who I can vent to. And, you know, my, my coaches like Joey Rodriguez and I are my boxing coach are super close. So yeah, people that have just been there for me and, you know, my best friends, every, everything. So it's- What did uh, your brother die from? Uh, he, he got murdered. Um, oh my God. Yeah, it was, he, he, he grew up, um, just a lot of mental illness and addiction and mm. stuff like that. And it was- uh, Same with my brother. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bad, yeah, horrible thing. Even, mm-hmm. yeah, my father, same type of stuff, you know, it's just, you know, yeah, it's a shitty, shitty circumstance. Yeah. Those things are really hard to deal with. I, what I try to share with people uh, as much as I can, because I've had to deal with death, unfortunately, many times. I was a pro wrestler for years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would say like half of my friends are dead. Uh, from drug, alcohol abuse, and different things. My brother's dead. My mom's dead. Like I've had to deal with it many times over. The only thing I can think of that uh, is any sort of saving grace is maybe you can think of some of the characteristics that your bro had uh, that were good. You know, whatever mm-hmm. those things, whatever the, those things were, and just plan forward. Have him live inside you, and uh, maybe through that he could live on in some way. Yeah, and that's the same. Like some people haven't experienced or been around death, but I'm I'm the same way as you. It's like I've been around so much death, but it's like even just when it was you know my brother and my even though he he was going through all these issues you know in his life, it was just it was just a different type of pain you know, and the way it went down. That's why the, the last Saturday, the only thing I have of his is like he was in Taekwondo and he was a mm-hmm. second degree black belt and stuff yeah. like that. And it's like, the only thing I have is I have his black belt. I have all his belts. And so I like, I walked out with his belt and uh, yeah, he was always there for me. And I, I remember things, people picking on me and he him beating them up <laughs> and stuff, you know, for that. But it's, uh, yeah, it is, it is tough, man. It's, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's just some people have a hard time just uh, cope, coping with life. You know, if I was to think about my brother and if I was to think about uh, how I would still want him here or my dad would still want him here or my brother, other brother would still want him here. Um, I just kind of think it's selfish because he just he didn't have the coping mechanisms to be here any longer. And mm-hmm. so um, unfortunately, I think that's that was his time to go. Yeah. And and, and, and I've thought about that because he's he's had a tough life like. If any, I'm thinking about what he's gone through and he was, you know, he was homeless and stuff and in and out of all these other programs and stuff like that. But it's, uh, he had a tough life, like the toughest life. So when I'm going through any, anything that's somewhat tough, it's like, this is fucking nothing compared <laughs> right. to what he went through. And, uh, and I was always helping him always like my mom and I were the only ones helping him. And we, we wanted it him to do better. Like we wanted it more than he did all the mm-hmm. time. We just, yeah, never. But even the the good thing about it was like the I actually talked to him the the morning of before he died, and it was a good conversation. Usually, we'd get mm. off the phone like yelling at each other because I'm <laughs> yeah. like I'm so frustrated that he's doing this, and I just want him to do good. Yeah, um, yeah it was a good conversation. I was like, oh, I was like. I hung up like happy, like, you know, I was like, oh, that was a really good conversation. He actually went by my mom's house and same type of thing. He was in a good mood and I'm glad that it left on that note, you know? Um, but yeah, it, yeah. It's, yeah, it was the same thing with me. My brother, <laughs> the last thing he said to me was don't be a pussy <laughs> because uh, I was competing uh, the next day. And I, when I competed, I ended up uh, doing like breaking all my best wow. lifts and I ended up uh winning the competition and ended up uh, breaking some like all-time world records and stuff wow. like that and then I found out the next morning that he was no longer with us wow wow I think some people you know I, I it's a weird thing to think about but I think some people are for whatever reason they're just kind of a tortured soul you yeah, know and that's that like way. that's heartbreaking but I I feel that that's the way that my brother was he just couldn't he had mental illness as well mm-hmm. and he just um was super frustrated and didn't know how to express it and mm-hmm. a lot of times it was with anger or violence or rage yeah. and it just uh it just wasn't good 
Yes, yeah, and, and thinking about that, it's yeah. He, he, I hate when people say they're in a better place, but he truly is in a better place mm -hmm. than he was because there was so much exactly what you're explaining. Probably a lot of similarities. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm curious about this with all the things that you've gone through as far as injuries, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are things that you feel or that your coaches have helped you do that are actually beneficial for your recovery over time? Because you've probably implemented so many different types of, you've probably done fucking, uh, uh, what's the needle shit? Oh, right. Dry needling. Dry oh, needling. Yeah. You've yeah. probably done a bunch of stuff, but what do you think is like actually been helpful for you as far as recovering as an athlete? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're doing cold hot therapy, like yeah, you're doing stuff like, like that. that. Yeah, I think it. I think it's everything. So I'm. Uh, I, I've been doing cryo forever. I, I'll go to Asha Bathhouse and do like the cold hey, plunges. Yeah, I love that. I yeah. love that spot. I, mm -hmm. I like that. And uh, like I float, you know. Yeah. I, have you guys ever I've heard of Capital that. Floats? Like I'll, I'll hook you guys up with some floats after yes. this. So oh, Cap shit. Floats. There's one on um, Broadway. Okay. And there's also one up in. Uh, Auburn. That, That's that isol float tank yeah, isolation it's a deprivation, deprivation tank. tank. So it's, uh, I want to say it's like 12 to 15 um, ounces of water, or not ounces, uh, 12 to 15 inches of water. It has like a thousand pounds of Epsom salt. So you're mm -hmm. buoyant, but it has, you know, it's, it's dark. I think the best way to do it, you can go in there, you can listen to music, you can have lights, but I think the best thing to mm -hmm. do is just turn all that off. So there's, you know, there's, it's pitch black in there. Um, you know, you can't hear anything. Sounds terrifying. <laughs> yeah. No, it is crazy. And, and you're, you're literally floating though. Mm -hmm. the, the water is room temp or body temperature. So mm -hmm. you just feel like you're floating and you, cause you are. And uh, it's hard cause we're so used to all the, this, the distractions and stuff like our phone, our mind. So it's literally just you in there by yourself. And you're like, you have all these racing thoughts. Um, but it's awesome. I do a lot of visualization in there mm -hmm. and I truly try to just relax. Um, I always tell people, give it at least like three times, do three sessions before you make a decision about it mm -hmm. um, because it will get better and better. And uh, there's a lot of like CEOs and executives that float and they, they come out and then they go into like a different room and they'll start jotting down notes or things that have come to them. And it's, and it's, that helps a ton. I wonder what that's like high, just to be honest. Like, well, that's that's yeah. all I could think about was just taking mushrooms and going. <laughs> that's, that's what a lot of people are really scared. Now. A lot of people though, they're like, you know, they'll take an edible and go in there or, Ooh. hey, yeah, take some mushrooms. They, they, they do, uh, <laughs> they do um, on some nights, it's like the new moon. I think you can go in there for eight hours. Like I, I've never done that in eight hour float, but that would be tough. But that's, that's when you could take your mushrooms nice. possibly, but. <laughs> I'm down. Yeah. That'd be wild, right? <laughs> oh, dude. But but I, I do everything. Like I I I do like in my house. I have a red light therapy, a juve. You know, I do that every day. I that too. Um, yeah. you know, I just do everything for recovery. You know, I, I, my norm tech, just anything I can do, mm -hmm. I, I I do. Mm -hmm. And I I picture your wife being like super supportive in this, oh. like where she's like trying to make sure that you got whatever you need to get to and your meals and all that kind of stuff. A hundred percent. Like without her, like she keeps my schedule and keeps me on track. And That's you know, awesome. I, I have amazing. the excuse where I can say like, oh, I get hit in the head too much, but like, <laughs> she's like, she's dialed in and she's, she's an interior designer and stuff too. <laughs> oh, so sick. she's creative in her own way, but she's like super, you know, just structured. So mm -hmm. she, she holds everything together and like, yeah. I, I couldn't do it without her. And, and a lot of times it's like me, 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 but I'm like, this is, you know, that's my rock. That's like mm -hmm. my world. She, she does everything for me. And she's like, she's all in on me, you know, and it's, you know. It's, that's incredible. Yeah, it's, it really is. When you I'm have lucky. this, this uh, like vision board thing going on, like uh, what are some things that you think you need to do? Is there anything in particular you need to work on or you think it's just a matter of time before you do get that title shot and before you do uh, have the UFC championship belt wrapped around your waist by Dana White? Yeah, that's, that's the ultimate goal, you know, but then there's so much like I'm fighting because I want to, you know, I want to set up my family. I, I want to set up my friends and family, everyone that's been there, you know, it's like the better I do, the better everyone does, my coaches. And so that's what I'm, that's what I'm fighting for. You know, it's like, they're all helping me behind the scenes, even though it's just me when I'm fighting, it's like, it's a huge team effort. And, and, and I go in there, you know, knowing that and thinking about everybody. And um, yeah, I like that. And it's not from a, 
it's not from like an overwhelming side because people can no. get overwhelmed by that. Like, oh, I have to go provide for my family. I have to go do all this, you know. And sometimes mm -hmm. people take that on and they, they feel like kind of nervous or scared yeah. about it. You're kind of taking it on as more of like a prideful thing. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. And I, I tell people, you know, all the time, it's like, I don't like to fight. You know what I mean? I, I feel like with my my age and stuff. Like, oh, you guys say that. <laughs> no, I but, but I don't. There, <laughs> there's some people in there like mm. smile. Like I like the lifestyle, you know, uh, not <laughs> having a having a, like a boss over me. Um, but I always say with my age and stuff, I, I'm in too deep. You know what I mean? It's like, if, if I win the lotto tomorrow, you might not ever see me in there, again, <laughs> you know? But I'm in too deep. There's nothing that I can do right now where I can make these big chunks of change. Um, and so, yeah, and it's really, I, I put in hundreds or thousands of hours of training to potentially fight 15 to 25 minutes, you know? And it's like, the fight is easy. Like even my, my fight on Saturday, um, maybe it didn't go the way that I wanted. I wanted it to be like a crazy barn burner, all this stuff, but I, I feel great now, you know, it didn't go that way. Um, it was a little more technical and I played it a little safe just to get my hand raised, but man, it was, it was relatively, it was a, it was an easy fight. Like I'm sure he's fine too. You know, I'm mm -hmm. like, he had a little cut. I had some marks on my face, but they're, they're basically healed up now. I could literally, I could go fight this weekend if I, uh, if I wasn't fighting at 145. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you said good chunks of change. Um, I've heard rumors from different podcasts and just like whatever Twitter and whatnot that like, uh, UFC doesn't pay out very much. I, I remember hearing something like, oh, your base pays only like four grand if you show up and then you get paid a little bit more if you win um, without giving your numbers or anything like that. Is there any truth to that? Like, is there like a, a certain base pay that some yeah, of the- Yeah, there there was um, base pay. I think the the entry level, if you make your debut, I want to say it's either 10,000 to show and 10,000 to win. So most of people's contracts are- um, it's like split unless unless you've been fighting for a while and you have like a guaranteed money or something like that. But say you were just like, like for me, for instance, um, since I took it on a four day notice at that time, almost six years ago, it was 10 and 10. But since I was fighting a tough guy on a four day notice, they gave me 12 and 12, you know? Mm, okay. And, and then it, whatever your contract is, it's a, um, say it's a three or four fight contract, you win, typically those numbers will move up. In your first set of contracts, it, maybe it goes up like, two and two on each side. Um, but yeah, it, it is tough. Like if mm. someone made their debut um, and was they were getting 10 and 10, say like me, I fought in Amsterdam, those ticket sales were expensive. So mm. you get, they cover yourself and one coach. I have three coaches. So I paid $2,200 um, per tick for two tickets to Rotterdam which was expensive. I paid for my wife's ticket, 22, and then my best friend because he's, you know, helped me get here. And uh, so just alone, that was basically my, my mm -hmm. show money. Okay, then I get there, Europe, the rooms are tiny. I have to get more rooms, it's more expensive, pay for that. Um, if I would have lost, I would have been in the hole, um, but I won. And so I made a little bit of money, but th that was okay. That was a, a different circumstance, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it just depends, but I've seen people that get in, you know, and they, they do the same thing I did. They fly across the world, they get their ass beat on TV <laughs> and they paid, they basically go in the hole three, four grand. <laughs> That's horrible. But as you get into second sets of contracts, you're doing better, you're moving mm -hmm. up in the rankings. As long as you're winning fights and you're, you're doing well, they will take care of you. I still feel like we should be getting paid a lot more, you know, mm -hmm. and everyone, oh, everyone's always going to say that, you know, but, uh, but now like I am grateful for the UFC because I, I've, you know, I was able to travel the world, do things I always wanted to buy a house, do so much more mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have been able to do. It was way worse. The UFC. You know, it used to be way yeah. worse before the UFC there. I mean, fighting wasn't even like allowed a lot of times. And then when UFC came around, they had a lot of issues with it being banned in certain States and yeah. they're still working through a lot, but it is interesting. You know, last night, Kansas City Chiefs, uh, mm -hmm. Travis Kelsey caught a, the game-winning touchdown from Patrick Mahomes. Mm -hmm. Travis Kelsey, uh, $57.5 million contract thrown to him by the $500 million man, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Patrick Mahomes, you know. It's just a, it's a different sport, you know, and that there's so much behind it and mm -hmm. there, there's so much uh, legacy. You know, UFC is like, it's a baby in yeah. comparison to the NFL and, and in terms of like, you know, football's been around for a hundred years or something mm -hmm. like that in the United States and versus uh, the UFC, maybe what, 20, 30 years? Yeah. 30 years of UFC, I guess. Yeah, you know? I'd say so.
somewhere in that range. So it's going to take, it's, you know, hopefully mm-hmm. the fighters and hopefully everyone continues to make more money, but it has helped fighters make more money because I think uh, even going back, like even 10 years ago, people were making a lot less. And yeah. if you go back before the UFC, I'm not even sure. I think you had to go fight for like at pride and you had to go and fight in Japan. Yep. And, you know, I think it was pretty ugly and just, <laughs> I don't think anyone cared about your health either. No, not at all. And, and at it, least there's attention to that now. And now we have like the Performance Institute, you know, mm-hmm. and they're opening up these um, institutes all over the world, which are, you know, it's nice if you you live in that state or that country because then you have food for you, you have the supplements and, and we can get like, we can get the supplements and stuff. Um, you have physical therapy, some of the best PTs mm-hmm. in the country, you know, that they used to work for the Olympic Training Center. We have some of the really good strength coaches and stuff like that. So it's nice if you live there, but even if I go out for treatment, it's not too much from Sacramento to fly to Vegas and then just get a hotel room. Then I can access that. Um, as much as I want on their dime. And they're actually going to build a, a hotel. So all the fighters can actually stay there. So you will just have to cover your your airfare, which which is amazing. Nice. Wow. What about, uh, how about any any ventures outside of fighting? Like I see you're with uh, Vayner Sports, which is pretty fucking cool. Uh, we're all rocking the, uh, the, the, <laughs> you know, the apparel. Where can people get the apparel, by the way? Yeah, so um, they can go to joshemmett.com. Like everything that I mm-hmm. am a part of, um, is, is on my website okay. and, uh, yeah, we'll be c- coming out with some more apparel, hopefully soon, uh, Calibus, you know, they're, they're a local company that, man, they, they helped me out so much, uh, with making these, mm-hmm. these shirts, um, for this fight, you know, they took care of everything and shipped nice. everything out. So I just focus solely on the, on the fight and they're going to come out with some new stuff, but I'm i I'm a part of, you know, the, Capital Floats, uh, Vibe Health Bar, and stuff like that. Some of the local mm-hmm. stuff around Sacramento, and yeah, I'm always trying to. Oh, I've been over to that place before. I think I went there kind of a long time ago. They make Vibe all Health different kind yeah. of uh, acai. Uh, yeah, I had some protein coffee. <coughs> okay, shake thing. It was freaking awesome. Yeah, we smoothies, go acai. The they got a bunch of food and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, there's one in Folsom, one on Broadway, and then one on H Street as well. What's Vayner Sports? So Vayner Sports is my uh, my management team. Oh, cool. Um, you know, I'm managed by Lloyd Pearson, um, Sarah, mm-hmm. Gary, and uh, AJ Vaynerchuk, um, all mm-hmm. them. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been amazing. I've been with them for 18 months and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the the future with them. You know, on, on YouTube, you hear a lot like YouTubers are talking about drugs and different types of sports or whatever, right? Um, does it ever like cross your mind in terms of other guys in the UFC? Because like, I think TJ Dillashaw like was called like EPO or some shit and his career got derailed. I don't know how he's doing now, but does that ever cross your mind in terms of your opponents at all? Not, not so much, you yeah. know, it really doesn't just because going back to the preparation, I'm, I work so hard and uh, if someone's doing something, maybe they just recover a little faster, but it's a, uh, I always think it's not going to make you fight better. Maybe just, yeah. and, and I'm in tip top shape, so I can, I can match anyone's, um, mm-hmm. you know, conditioning. And so, even when they're saying that, you know, this guy has a gas tank or something, mm-hmm. I'm always like, I'll, I'll match and beat that gas tank. So not, mm-hmm. not really, you know. What about in terms of like for injury, like are you allowed to take uh, like certain things for recovery of those, like um, peptides or anything, or are you just not even like aware of? Yeah, see, any I'm not, of that. We just stay out of it. Yeah, I'm so I'm so nervous. Like just talking about before, it's uh, you know, a lot of people they're like, oh, that guy's on steroids. It's only yeah. a matter of time he's mm-hmm. gonna pop and stuff. I've been tested by USADA so many times. Like, I, I'm I'm getting closer now to getting my Letterman's jacket. I had a while ago. I got my <laughs> my 25 clean tests in a row. You know, shirt. <laughs> at, at, at 50, you get you literally get a, a oh, Letterman's no jacket that says USADA and has a big 50 X on it. So <laughs> I, I'm getting closer to that. You they know, really do that. They, they do that, crazy. yeah. And so uh, wow. that's got to be kind of funny too, because yeah. like you know, for these competitions, you're weighing 145 pounds. You're like, yeah, yeah also extremely jacked. <laughs> yeah, but, right, but right, I'm, right. I'm small. Look at you guys. You know right, what I mean? Right. Like, you look at your pictures. You're <laughs> fucking jacked. Yeah. But see, t- yeah. TV does some stuff and some pictures, and then, uh, <laughs> but like like I was saying, people will meet me and they're like, in person, they're like, oh, you're not as big as I thought you were. I thought you were like six one, two hundred pounds. I'm like. 
I fight at 145 pounds. Why would you think I'm six <laughs> one, 200 pounds? You know, um, but, but I, I, I don't take anything that's not third party tested, the the NSF certified, the trusted sport. Just because I'm so, I, I'm just, you know, it only be even if it wasn't like a performance enhancement drug, and it was something just tainted in a regular supplement. If it said Josh Emmett failed USADA, everyone would be like, I told you, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, sometimes I'll play into it. Like people will post like needles on my mm -hmm. stuff and I'm like, catch me if you can, just playing, <laughs> you know, like playing into it. But it's like, yeah, I just get, I just get nervous for stuff yeah. like that, you know? So I, I, I don't mess around with anything that, yeah. How are things with like testing. sponsors and stuff? Are you guys allowed to kind of freely be sponsored by, you know, kind of whomever within reason and, and promote? Uh, supplements and mm -hmm. different things like that? Yeah, hundred percent. Like uh, I can be sponsored by whoever and promote whatever I want. The only time is like actually in the, like fight week now, you know, like we don't have, we have Venom as our sponsorship. So I can't put the person's logo on and, my trunks yeah, or my banner, but I, I can promote it all fight week and do whatever. It's just, and I'm always looking for sponsorships and that's been kind of challenging for me. You know, it's like for whatever reason, I just, yeah, I just don't have a whole lot of like sponsorships. And I'm looking more like monetary stuff to, right. to help cover, uh, you know, a lot of my recovery and, 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 and training and things like that. So yeah, I'm always open for it and, and we can yeah, have sponsors by whoever. Yeah, it's interesting years ago when the fighters could were, were kind of free to do whatever they wanted and they could put stuff on their shorts and their, but then I think Reebok came in and that mm -hmm. changed. And then I think now like on game day, going to the ring, only uh, UFC yeah. like issued stuff, right? Yeah, and it's kind of tough because even going back to fighting on the regional scene, it's like I was making more just from local businesses from Sacramento and sponsorships than I do from my current sponsorship that I can only have on my, my shorts, you know, it's wow. cause it's on a tiered system uh, through Venom. I think it's like your first five fights, it's, it's like 2,500, then five to 10, it's five grand or something, you know, it's, yeah, it's nice. crazy. So it's, yeah, it's not that much, but yeah. it is what it is. It's interesting. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen uh, Bones Jones, uh, complain about it quite a bit and hopefully hopefully things get better hopefully the fights uh you know get up or the fighters get an opportunity to continue to make more money because it it's great to just see like the evolution of the ufc it's been mm -hmm. crazy and i think a, a a part of it has been obviously people just want to be more competitive with each other but i think having the money in there i think is certainly helpful yeah no it, it, that people the recognize time, yeah. they can make a, a career a living out of it i think is a a big a big difference what's coming up for you next Man, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, I, I feel a little banged up right now, but uh, I'll be talking with my manager tomorrow. And then hopefully I'm just trying to see what, what we can do uh, next and, and, and who the next opponent is and just, you know, get me that much closer to the, to the title because I'm so close. You know, I'm just knocking on the door and uh, that's, that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to achieve. Have some of the guys that you've beaten more recently, have, have they tangled with the top three? Yeah, um, not in featherweight. Like I, I've be, Michael Johnson, he was at lightweight. You know, mm -hmm. he 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 knocked out Dustin Poirier. He was he was always in the top three um, in the lightweight division. You know, he fought Khabib. Um, he beat Tony Ferguson. He, you know, all the top. So guys. yeah, you're right there. Yeah, mm -hmm. right there. And, and and even just some of the the guys that yeah, I I beat a lot of tough tough veterans and a lot of they were always the next big thing. They were on like a three four fight winning streak, supposed to be mm -hmm. the next big thing, and then they fight me and uh, lose. And then my wife and I have always been saying I'm the curse. Like if you go and look at <laughs> like on Sure Dog, if you look at no matter what win or lose, if they just fight me, they're always winning, and then they go on just a skid, like every single person. That should be your nickname. Yeah, the curse. The yeah. curse. I, I got all these other crazy nicknames yeah. people giving like me, but- uh, Buzzkill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I do like it. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I hope Ige, I hope he's not affected by that because he's, he's, a, he's a good, good dude. Mm -hmm. And it's like out of everyone that, um, I was supposed to fight someone in front of me and he, he couldn't get cleared in time. So they offered me Ige and some guys further behind him. So I took him because he's the highest ranked guy. But out of everyone, I didn't want to fight the guy just because mm -hmm. he, he's such a good dude. And and even when I was staying out in Vegas after my surgery for two months, he lives out there. Mm -hmm. He was always in the PI and Performance Institute. And uh, yeah, we were just talking. I was like, sh I told him after the fight, man, I didn't want to fight you. He's like, yeah, same. But it was just business. Mm. That's got to be weird. Yeah, going in there yeah. against someone that you don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I fight. don't know any of the guys, but it's like, I really like you know, he just had a, a kid eight right. months ago. And so, and it's just like, shit, I don't want to. 
and he's friends with a lot of the coaches and mm -hmm. some of our teammates and stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Appreciate it. Thank out. you so much for your time today. Thanks for uh, coming out and uh, we mm -hmm. wish you the best of luck. And I can't wait to see you uh, fighting for that title one day. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate thanks it. Thanks for guys. the sweatshirt. Of yeah, course. Man, thank you. <laughs> this guy on here. stuff. Yo. Fucking Jack. He looks 6'1", 220. Huh? <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. Sure thing. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe. Uh, yeah, for sure, comment. Let us know what you guys think about today's episode and subscribe if you guys are not subscribed already. Uh, please follow the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project on Instagram, at MB Power Project on TikTok and Twitter. My Instagram and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z, at the Andrew Z on TikTok. And then uh, also any links for uh, anything related to Josh, please make sure you guys check out the uh, description down below for all of that good stuff. And Seema, where are you at? I didn't see any on Instagram and YouTube. I didn't see Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Twitter, Josh? Uh, Josh Emmett UFC, so J O S H E M M E T T UFC, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and I have a Facebook fan page as well. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never a weakness, weakness is never strength. Catch you all later.